I am Sarah White, and I'm pleased to bring you this short video on two pioneers and innovators, R. David Anderson and Harold Godwin, who developed Ohio State Services with Clifton J. Lachalet. Both have full conversations, which can be found on the ASHP Foundation website under the Leadership Programs tab. It is common to think our challenges are insurmountable. However, there have always been obstacles to work around. We can learn from those that have gone before us as they face challenges such as being the first pharmacist in hospitals. You will find there have never been enough resources or money to do what we knew we should do, and these people were resourceful, persisted, and found a way. The first excerpt is from R. David Anderson, who was the first full-time pharmacist in a 170-bed community hospital in Virginia. You will hear how he built his services, getting the hospital auxiliary to purchase a laminar flow hood since the hospital didn't have any equipment money. He also knew his patients needed clinical services, so he set up a shared clinical pharmacist with three other small local hospitals to enable him to hire a PharmD. And you then went to Ohio State as an assistant director. Now, how did you get from Ohio State when your family wasn't as happy in Columbus, Ohio, back to Waynesboro? Well, we always uh, took our vacations and come back to, to, to Stanton. I guess the last summer that we were there on vacation, I just happened to know the director, the administrator at the Waynesboro Hospital because he had been in the, in the course on hospital administration run by Mr. Cardwell at the Medical College of Virginia Hospital when I was working in the pharmacy. So Barry Kennard and I were, had known each other even back then, uh, several years, oh, about 10 years earlier or more. And I uh, just happened to go by to visit with him, and he said, well, I need a pharmacist here. Uh, he had just some part-time help, I believe. And so it didn't take long for us to decide, well, we're going to jump at this opportunity. And as I say, it was probably the biggest professional mistake I ever made. But in retrospect, I never would have been able to have done the things that I did because if I continued at Ohio State, I would have been living and working in the shadow of that great man, Clifton J. Lachalet, and would never have been able to get out and do the things that I was able to do with the support that I had at, at uh, Waynesboro Community Hospital. So that may be a, a lesson about don't burn bridges. You never know who later might be of help to you, correct? <laughs> well, right. <laughs> so how did you go about developing, and what did you find at Waynesboro when you got there in terms of the systems, and then how did you go about developing? You were the director there for 23 years, I believe. Well, it was pretty sad, and I mentioned earlier <laughs> that I had no help to start with. Pharmacy itself physically was just a room with some shelving and, and a bunch of bottles of pills and so forth. And there was again a floor stock arrangement on every nursing station. They all had all the drugs they thought they needed and they were sending the, the requisitions down with the empty bottles which we refilled and sent back to the floor. And eventually, with all the experience that I'd had previously working with at Ohio State and certainly with the committee on safety practices and procedures, I began to realize how many mistakes and errors were being made. And uh, something had to change. So uh, it wasn't long before I realized that unit dose was the only thing that we could really do that would uh, resolve many of these problems and improve the care that our patients were getting. So I quickly began to look at that very seriously. So she had no money, had no equipment, nothing to go on at all. And, uh, but I said, well, we're gonna do it one way or the other. And I developed some fairly unique ways of trying to deliver drugs in unit doses. And I could go on for quite a while describing some of the things that we did were probably not, it certainly compromised the quality of the drugs, I guess, when we got through with it, but it certainly was a way of getting up there to the floor in a way that the nurses didn't have to make those selections and make those decisions that they previously made because everything was labeled up until the time that the patient received the drug. So how did you learn about 
how people were doing unit dose. That came from Ohio State. As I say, I never had an idea of my own. I stole it from Larry Schaup, who was one of our early residents at Ohio State when I was there. And Schaup started the, one of the very early unit dose programs up on 10 Central, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, I realized, shucks, if they can do it, or we could do it at Ohio State, we can do it here. And Larry didn't have any more equipment, any more knowledge of it than, than I did. But he started it and he developed it and it began to roll. And so I said, well, I can do this as well. Unfortunately, uh, I had so little help that it eventually overwhelmed us. And I finally said to nursing, I'm sorry, I've got to give this up. And I went to the administrator and said, I can't do this anymore. It's working us to death. And so then he authorized some additional help, and then we picked up again, or, or just began to roll. And then eventually we got into uh, IV admixtures. I got the uh, hospital auxiliary, the, the ladies who sort of helped run a lot of the volunteers and so forth. I got them to purchase a lam small laminar, four-foot laminar flow hood, and we began to develop our IV admixture program, the first in the state of Virginia. Our unit dose program was the second in the state of Virginia, but it turned out, I think, to be the most comprehensive unit dose program, and nothing went up to the floor virtually except maybe some cleaning supplies that we were providing that wasn't in unit dose. And uh, then our IV admixture program began to roll, and we and had very, very tight control on that, which the nurses had no control whatever, and it was done in the most uh, germ-free atmosphere you could think of when they did it on the floor. We were doing these things in the laminar flow hood and providing a fair amount of control that was impossible on the nursing unit. And then we uh, even looked at another idea that somebody had was doing syringe pre-filling. So in our, in our small laminar flow hood, we started uh, developing this program of syringe pre-filling and providing a complete syringe, labeled syringe to the nursing unit so she could give the drug without having to draw, reconstitute, draw up, and take this unlabeled syringe to the nursing, uh, uh, to the patient's bedside. And uh, so we began to develop that kind of control which obviously we never had before. And I think, again, we were one of the very early ones in the country to do that sort of thing. And then a dear, dear friend, Zachary Hannon up in, the, in uh, Long Island, had found this little syringe and fusion pump that was used primarily in research um, laboratories for animals, dogs, and rabbits, and rats, and so forth. This thing was not much bigger than that. And they had found that this thing could drive a 10 ml syringe over a period of 20 minutes uh, or 10 minutes. You could adjust the time, but there was nothing else you could do. There were no bells and whistles. There was n not a thing that we could do except put the syringe in there, hit the start button, and it would gradually push that uh, uh, plunger on the syringe. And so we began to send up, uh, well, actually, we reconstituted bulk uh, antibiotics like cefazolin. And, and we'd withdraw that in one gram or 20 ml uh, syringes and label that, freeze them, and then eventually thaw them out when they were needed in a microwave to send them upstairs at the time they were needed. These were things that nobody else was doing. And every syringe infusion pump you see today with all the bells and whistles and multiple channels and so forth all began as a result of that little bitty pump that we were using. So all of these have been innovations. They took a lot of extra time and effort. Why do that? Well, I never did it from looking for glory or anything of that sort. It was just a necessary thing to make, make sure that patients were receiving good quality care with the little or no possibility of the side effects, uh, infection, uh, and to make sure that it was, the doses were correct. And we talked all the time about giving the right drug, the right patient of the right dose, the right time, and those kinds of things. And this was one way to accomplish that, it was to make it available to the nurse in a ready-to-use form that she had no 
manipulation, whatever to do. So how did you implement clinical services then in Waynesboro? Waynesboro was roughly 170 beds, something like that? that yeah. mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, there's another thing I felt that we just had to do. I could see so easily that things were going not as well as they should, and the fact is that this is the point in time I wrote an article published in AJHP entitled The, Phys the Physician's Contribution to Hospital Medication Errors. Cliff Latchley said, don't do that. We are not ready for this. We can't criticize physicians. And I felt we had to criticize physicians because they were doing so much that was wrong and uh, was hurting people, patients. And uh, so um, at this time, the whole clinical pharmacy program was just beginning to develop. And as I said, there was one uh, clinical pharmacist at the MCV hospital or at actually the School of Pharmacy. And uh, I said, well, we need that sort of, of opportunity and uh, good work done in the small hospital just as well as they have in the, in the teaching hospital. So I hired the first clinical pharmacist in the state of Virginia outside of MCV. And Ed Jones, who came to us from Duquesne University, began to develop that whole program there and, and an, an immediate acceptance on the part of the medical staff. This guy can help us. We can do things better and patients are going to benefit from it. So I think the medical staff accepted Jones and then eventually we had other clinical pharmacists come on. He moved on to the uh, Cleveland Clinics. Big up, step up for him and we had other people to come in and take over that program. And other things developed out of that, and I don't know if you'd want to con sure. consider, but we developed a, a shared clinical pharmacy program for uh, three hospitals in the Shenandoah Valley at King's Daughters Hospital, Waynesburg Community Hospital, and Rockingham Memorial Hospital in Harrisonburg. And we had a clinical pharmacist then that was serving all three hospitals and on a rotational basis. No one had ever done this before except that an attempt had been made up in Maine to do it. The three hospitals that had also de primarily developed a, or previously had developed a, a shared CT program so that they had a mobile CT scanner moving between the three hospitals. And I said, hey, if we can do that with a CT scanner, we can do this with clinical pharmacists. So I was agreeable to giving up my clinical pharmacist to head up this program and he would rotate between the three hospitals. And eventually, all the hospitals developed their own uh, improved and increased clinical pharmacy programs. And today at the Augusta Medical Center, which replaced both Waynesboro and King's Daughters Hospitals, the Augusta Medical Center has about five clinical pharmacists on staff, whereas before we owned it, never had more than one. The second part is Harold Godwin speaking at the 50th Ohio State University Hospital Administrative Residency Reunion. He describes how, as an assistant director, having just completed his MS residency with Cliff Lachalet in the 60s, they built the pharmacy services. These included IV admixtures, unit dose, clinical pharmacists, and pharmacy technicians administering medications. They also took the opportunity of a College of Pharmacy faculty sabbatical to provide practice-based formal courses, which set Harold on a joint career path in education and hospital pharmacy administration. In 2009, the residency program celebrated its 50th anniversary. The following perspectives were recorded at the reunion. First, we're going to hear Harold Godwin reflect on developing services with Cliff during the 60s as he was an assistant director after completing his MS residency. Finally, we're also going to hear from so several randomly selected people who were either residents or staff with Cliff. You will hear me asking questions off camera. Listen for aspects that you can apply in your practice. Well, thank you, and it's certainly my pleasure to be here, and I forgot about that videotape. I do remember fond memories of being there, but I uh, kind of forgot about that. Um, this, this is really, how many of you were born before 1969? 
I hope you're in the minority. So am I. Okay. Uh, I, I really like these pictures because it does show I did have hair. Um, but at any rate, so we look at the decade of the 60s. What were they? What was the world around us? Well, uh, JFK assassination, Martin Luther King assassination, Robert Kid Kennedy assassination, uh, Vietnam, uh, the draft lottery numbers. I was 322, thank God. Uh, all my classmates were enrolling with Milt Scolot in the Public Health Service, uh, right out of the residency program at that particular time. Uh, but it also was the man on the moon. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, Medicare started, uh, and uh, Woodstock happened. So certainly those were turbulent times, but those were really changing times. And I guess that takes me to the decade of the 60s in hospital pharmacy because indeed they were changing times. Uh, just a year or so before that though, Cliff Lachelet, 1968, or 1958 rather, became the new director of pharmacy at OSU Hospitals. Uh, and he came from Michigan uh, where he had completed the audit of the pharmaceutical uh, services in hospitals through a PHS grant and that turned out to be a published book, The Mirror to Hospital Pharmacy in 1964. Now, many of you all thought the broken mirror came first, uh, you know, but it, but it really didn't. It was a reference to the mirror, and uh, we all celebrate the, uh, the broken mirror. I think Leon Viteska had something to do with that, uh, you know, back in that, uh, in that particular uh, era. But Cliff comes to uh, Clem OSU, and it has never been anything like it since. Interesting, though, to talk about the mirror to hospital pharmacy, and I don't know how many of you have actually ever seen it. It's a, it's a blue-bound uh, volume. But um, it was sad, but it was really heartening because Phil Schneider and Mary Alice Bennett and myself uh, went to Cliff's house after Cliff had died in 1995 and helped Jane essentially clean out his office. And there we found the Mirror to Hospital Pharmacy. And in that, he had post-it notes, modern day, sticking out of the edges of it with when these things had accomplished. And so predicting unit dose, predicting clinical pharmacy, predicting, you know, a pharmacy and therapeutics committee, predicting, predicting things like that. And so that mirror is uh, at the ASHP headquarters in their archives now. But I thought putting those things together, that was uniquely Cliff because something just didn't get finished and he forgot about it, but he really retained that. And I guess that's the legacy that we're really talking about. Well, he came in 60, I mean, he in 60, I guess I'll start with the first year, and his total floor stock, no 24-hour service, uh, a few pharmacists, and that's the first thing that he really started to work on. And many of you had thesi to do that all dealt with stability and quality and all of that. And I think that it may have really come from Cliff's era, I guess, in, in being in, in, in Michigan where they did a lot of manufacturing. A uh, little bit known, they were still making IVs in bottles in the 1970s at the University of uh, uh, Michigan. Thank God we didn't. Uh, we figured out we could buy it better than we could probably blow ourselves up with autoclaves and you know and all of that kind of stuff. But Cliff really started with quality, and he had Ben Holland uh, actually was director of operations in 1960, and uh, Andy Anderson. You may or may not have met Andy Anderson. What a fine gentleman, past president of ASHP, past uh, Whitney Award winner, and and certainly a colleague of Cliff because. In 1961 and 19, or 1960, 1961, uh, Cliff at that time was president of ASHP. So like Paul Parker, you know, was really essentially saying Cliff was never there. So thank God he had Andy and he had Ben, you know, to kind of keep the thing going, uh, you know, pretty well. So he really started, uh, you know, with quality. And uh, in uh, 1961, per, you know, what we really have here, the idea gelled. And uh, so we started a residency program and Melvin Simon was the first uh, resident. Melvin here today? That's a joke because we have not seen a Melvin, I don't think, since he, since he had that picture taken and it was posted. And, and, and truly, it's like, where's Waldo? I mean, you know, if, if, if anybody finds him, why, let us know. I mean, we need to give him an award or something. I mean, because he, he's been incognito for quite a while. But anyway, he was the first resident. But uh, Cliff always focused on quality, and we really did have to manufacture a lot of things. And you can't believe it. There was not such a thing as 70% alcohol. I mean, so we started with 95 or 100% alcohol and had the diluter. We needed big, big vats. You know, we did that. We made hydrogen peroxide. We made 0.25% uh, uh, acetic acid for a bladder irrigation and all of that. And, and, but the thing is, everything had a worksheet. You know, double check. Everything had a lot number on it. 
And not only that, Cliff was a nutcase on labeling because if we'd have a bottle, literally the bottle went into a, a little kind of a plexiglass slide deal. So you put the label on at the same height and in the same position for everything that you made. So when all these bottles were on a shelf, you know, it looked like they were really coming out of a manufacturer. So, you know, that was unique, but I think it really does point to his, you know, excellence in, in quality, and that really went, you know, all the way through. Well, we uh, putted along uh, with that, started the residency program. Um, Andy Anderson started a drug information center, six books and a couple of, you know, journals and uh, files and all of that by therapeutic category and file, file, tear, file. Uh, but, you know, it was one of the beginnings, uh, essentially, of that. And then Larry Schaup, in 1963, started a unit dose pilot program on 10 East. And uh, that was unique and that was novel. We didn't have any unit dose packaging then, essentially. It was like a little, like nursing homes that we know today, the little cupule kind of things that you've got to package. Uh, he did start IV admixtures essentially as the, um, I mean, I guess as a unit dose, but he only did the LVPs, and so that became my shoulder <laughs> to figure out how to do piggybacks uh, a year or so later. But Larry really kind of started that, and Larry also started the first direct uh, physician's order form. So uh, uh, no carbon required. First, the uh, first models that he had actually had carbon paper in it. You know what carbon paper? You don't know what carbon paper is. <laughs> but, but at any rate, uh, no carbon required was magic. I mean, you didn't have to have three sheets. You only had to have the two. Uh, and so literally, we were now receiving orders, uh, you know, that were the physician's handwriting rather than being nurse transcribed. Uh, we did convert before we got to Unidose uh, to a five-day supply essentially called the individual order system in which most patients were there five days and so if they were on anything we'd give them a five day supply so if it was BID we'd give them 10, if it was QD we'd give them five, if it was you know, TID we'd give them 15. So we had all these things prepackaged, lot numbers on every one of them. Well the problem is, and Cliff, such a nutcase again on quality, it's like when the patient hopefully didn't expire but if they did or if they went home or the order was changed, all this stuff comes back that was prepacked. Well, Cliff says you got to put it all back by lot number, you know. So I think our stock of credits and lot numbers far, far exceeded, the, you know, our original stock. And so you're great for quality, but it's kind of not for, uh, to do really uh, do that. So in 1964, opportunity arose for a nuclear pharmacy. And so that's where the nuclear pharmacy program started. Gary Edwards, many of you may know him, started that, that whole uh, particular uh, program. And, uh, and then in 1965 was the, uh, an ASHP conference uh, here in Columbus, and it was to talk about this, Jerry, and it was to really talk about, uh, there were standards in ASHP at that time called internships, uh, but we were, I guess we were called residents, but for some reason the standards were kind of an internships. Now, you kind of said you had one and you did it, and, and the Paul Parker would compare Kentucky to, you know, and we'd compare it to Michigan, and all, but there was no accreditation at all. So literally the fundamental thing in 1965 was to establish standards nationally, call it a residency, and start the accreditation process. And so all of that really kind of started with SHP, but, you know, in Columbus, uh, Ohio. Um, and then, um, I guess 1966, I, I joined uh, the residency program in 1964, because we had that crazy thing to do as a thesis. And so, you know, I don't know whether I really selected it or I just got, you know, assigned by Cliff. But anyway, it was IV admixtures. And uh, so implementing an IV admixture program, you know, throughout the house and to do a pilot. Now, Larry had kind of started it, but we think about IV admixtures, lots of things. One, we had uh, literally uh, an amber glove box, no fan or anything in it. It was just a box that hopefully didn't get contaminated. I mean, we didn't know anything about a laminar flow hood at that time. So I think we bought the first laminar flow hood. Uh, that was a part of my project. Uh, I copied Larry's NCR, you know, direct order form so that I could get original orders of, of these. And uh, so then we thought, okay, we're going to start this IV admixture program. But we're going to do, we, I did a survey and I thought, it's really interesting. The potassiums and the LVPs and all of that, like, are one a day. These things called keflin and, you know, cefazolin, they're five and six times a day. We weren't doing those because nursing was putting them in a buretrol. It's a little plastic kind of thing that they used to use in pediatrics. And so the nurse would kind of, you know, fill it up, squirt the stuff in it, and away we would go because the nurses were mixing all the IVs. So 
Cliff says, how are you gonna do that? It beats the hell out of me. Um, so I thought, you know, I don't think we're gonna be buying Buretrols in these big sets and filling them up. So we had the idea, what about getting a little bitty bottle, maybe 50 cc's or 100 cc's, and we would put all of those things in that, the Keflins and so forth. Great idea, they didn't make it. But Cliff went out on a limb and essentially intermittent therapy, a whole new drug delivery system, was literally invented you know, at, at OSU in, in, in collaboration with each other, I guess. And so we ordered like 50 to 100 cases literally of, of IV fluids, but the smallest bottle I had then was 250. So here we had 50 mils in a 250 glass bottle, and that was the beginning of the mini bottle. And so that's why often early on they were called underfills. I mean, you know, there were more air in there than there really was, you know, liquid. But we'd hang a rice set, nurse would do that. We were making piggybacks like crazy, and you know, and away we went. And so we really started the whole, the whole program like that. And, it's, you know, it, we never looked back from that standpoint. Um, Cliff says, well, I wonder whether a technician can do this. Technicians were storekeepers. I wonder if they could do that. I said, well, I don't know. We'll give it a try. So literally for two months on my program, uh, we took Cliff's secretary, Judy Long, if anybody <laughs> remembers Judy. Said, okay, Judy, we've got a new little job description here for you. You know, you said in this laminar fluid and see if you can make these things and, you know, we do some cultures and all that and can you do reconstitution? So we did. So out of that whole study, you know, we really did the IV admixture program and it, you know, went gangbusters from there. And I guess the notoriety of that uh, was so successful uh, and, and I'll get to that in a minute, but essentially we put on, you know, many, many, many training sessions that all, you know, really came out of that particular program. 1967, Cliff had the idea, well, we need to be upstairs now because we found out all these things that were happening when we did the unit dose pilot, and now we're doing IV as it. There's, you know, we think we know what's going on in the pharmacy, but we really don't. It's all happening upstairs. And so we created the liaison pharmacist program. So what we did is assign a pharmacist to every nursing unit, and it was their responsibility to go visit every day. Hi, how are you? You know, I'm Charlie the pharmacist. You know, what I, can I do? Not much clinical stuff at that time. But it really did set the stage for the visitation and how we really started, you know, that whole particular uh, program. And so that was in, 19, uh, that was in 1967. Uh, and, and in early 67, I started then as an assistant director. I finished the program. And, and I'll just say to the young people and, and probably everybody even here that, there is such a thing as serendipity, uh, and, and that is you have to take advantage of you know, opportunities that present themselves, whether you know that or not. But anyway, I got a call in the Cliff's office, right, of being a new assistant director, and he says, you know, Dean Parks just called me. He says, Notari's going on vacation, or vacation, sabbatical. And uh, Notari teaches two courses. And uh, Parks says, send one of your young guys over here to, you know, bail us out. I was the young guy. So uh, it turned out that I had to end up teaching dispensing lab, uh, and I also had to teach an OTC course. But the other thing, and several of us walked by it today, you didn't even know there was one, an old school pharmacy. It's up on Neal Avenue. So not only that, I found out that was the summer they were moving. So now I had to move all that junk out of the lab into the new school of pharmacy, develop a whole new dispensing lab and teach OTCs. And then Cliff wanted to know why I wasn't around. You know, I mean, because he, he, he was a god as much as I was. But knowing Cliff, he says, now this isn't going to be a compounding thing you're going to do. I go, huh? And he says, this has got to be a clinical dispensing lab. What the hell is a clinical dispensing lab? I spent my whole summer making out patient profiles and fake prescriptions and, and getting drug samples in, you know, and all of that. To do all of that one-on-one -on -one, so all of these students essentially had their own patients, you know, they had their own profile. And, and so Cliff, and Cliff was really happy about that. And this clinical pharmacy in the community level. And I think even today, we still don't have electronic medical record, do we? Or we still don't have, you know, full patient profiles really on everybody. Uh, but it was really a beginning there. But this, this serendipity is why I've been, I guess, a professor all the rest of my career. Because when I interviewed for Kansas, I said, yeah, I'm director of pharmacy, but I like a faculty appointment. And, and so professor and associate dean and all that. So I've always been engaged, you know, with that teaching. Now the teaching paid off, and I will say, because it created a liaison with the students to our program or to other programs. In my very first class, we had, I think, some very notable names. We had Mick Hunt, who was one of my first students in, in this undergraduate class, who's gone on, you know, to this, president of ASHP. Uh, Rosalie Saygraves uh, was in that particular class, dean at, uh, at Illinois. 
Tim Webster, now deceased, but Tim Webster essentially was the CEO and the exec of ASCAP, uh, the consulting pharmacist organization, and our very own Mary Alice Bennett, you know, who has created her own empire, I guess, if you will, here with community pharmacy residency programs and uh, MTM. And now she finds herself, and if you haven't already, vote early and vote often because she's on the ballot for uh, APHA president uh, now as well. So there's my first four students, you know, out of that particular class. And so I think that really shows how that impact and that liaison really can kind of connect all the dots uh, from that standpoint. Well, uh, admixtures flourished, uh, unit dose kind of flourished, and I am really proud to say that, um, you know, along the way, Cliff got a lot, and I think it extends today, Cliff got a lifetime exemption from the fire marshal for skids in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, you know, we have a look back, uh, you know, on that one, and I saw that, uh, you know, very well today. But anyway, in 1968, and I'll, I'll go on from there, 1968, there was a tremendous nursing shortage um, at Ohio State. 30% of the beds were going to be closed. And so I remember if Cliff said, okay, we're all meeting in my house today. So we had a retreat in 68. Sit down, and Cliff says, you know, all the problems are on the nursing unit. They give the wrong drugs. We've got missing doses. We've got all that stuff. Let's put together a program called the Coordinated Drug Administration Program with the unit dose program. And essentially, that brainchild was in 68. You know, we did it. Cliff says, what I want out of that is I want all those vacant nursing positions as far as the money goes. And so we hired two nurses, hired a boatload of techs, boatload of new pharmacists, and really put it together, and that went on, you know, for essentially about 20 years. So, I mean, it really did set the stage uh, from that whole standpoint. The last thing that I will comment on is we often affectionately call it the bag shows, and that is that uh, because we were really ahead of the game, I think, in producing IV admixtures, thanks to Travenol and Bill Salen, who was, you know, on the program there, uh, was shown to be on the program at the 25th, uh, Ed Baxter, vice president, very, very far-thinking person. We probably trained over, I don't know, thousands of pharmacists because it wasn't included in school. It was a nursing responsibility and be, it was the transition to becoming a pharmacist responsibility. This thing went on for about 15 years. And so we had lots of teams. I mean, we had, you know, we had Cliff, Roger Anderson, Bill Miller, Larry Schaub, Tony Bonacci, Sarah White, Paula Brandlewis, Paul Pierpotti. We had a whole list of people myself included, you know, that, that really participated almost for a number of years, and we almost called ourselves the OSU Baxter University, you know, to put all of these things on. But not only did we talk about IV admixtures and IV uh, aseptic technique, but also we really dealt with enhancing your P&T committee, in, uh, chemotherapy compounding, quality assurance, all of those other kind of things, you know, that really help propel, I think, you know, the profession. Now, we're all lucky we didn't lose our jobs because we're gone all the time, you know, on affectionately uh, on the bag shows, but, but anyway. So that kind of ended 1969, and uh, as a postscript, Cliff became president then of uh, APHA uh, in uh, 1972. And in 1993, he was president of the American Managed Care Pharmacy Association. So he really was president of three national organizations. So in summary, the 60s were the decade of innovation, progress, and change for hospital pharmacy. We had new distribution systems were invented, clinical practice begins, drug administration program was initiated and uh, evaluated. The ASHP mid-year began during that decade, and residency education really uh, started with accreditation and it matured. And Cliff literally was at the forefront of all of those uh, particular activities. Uh, he was a visionary. Uh, he was extraordinarily creative, uh, dedicated to the profession, inspiring, a mentor, and a friend. He always liked Woody Hayes, and he always liked uh, Vince Lombardi, and he was always saying, win one for the Gipper. And I think that his true goal was, at that time and always was, that he really wanted his people to infiltrate and to be directors of pharmacy in major medical institutions or university hospitals to really continue to create that, that uh, legacy uh, of Ohio State. And so he always stood for um, enthusiasm for excellence, 
and the Big E, as we really called it, and he demanded it from all of us. And so in the last statement, I think that David Cavance, in his Clifton J. Lachalet Award presentation uh, this last uh, December, appropriately stated it when he said, essentially, Cliff and the program left an indelible, uh, indelible mark on all of us. And I think we all should be very proud of that. Thank you.